for Manhattan spots to have picnics in, Bryant Park is at the very top of my list. There's a beautifully mature feel to the park's shadowy walks and lush green lawn. Le Carousel's 14 delightfully painted animals, replicas of classic carousel creatures, revolve to the sounds of French cabaret music in the distant background. People gather casually to find a still moment alone, to chat with a close friend, to read a book, have a light lunch, or just pass quietly through from 6th to 5th avenues under the grandeur of the American Radiator Building, the Salmon Tower, and the Lofty Grace Building. And so, in advance of the arrival of my special guest for a summer picnic in the park, I have prepared a mid-afternoon spread of deliciously plump New York Deli BLTs, ice-cold bottled water, and a fruit cup dessert. Did I mention I came complete with an Irish tablecloth, silverware, picnic plates, crystal glasses, linen napkins, <laughs> and even a daffodil arrangement for the centerpiece? She must be very special, grins a curious cop in passing, just as stunning Irish actress and model Olivia Tracy enters Bryant Park. RadioIrish.com Well, here we are in beautiful Bryant Park in Manhattan speaking to the gorgeous and talented Olivia Tracy. How are you, Olivia? I am very well and very happy to be back here in New York City. It's wonderful for the summer. Well, it's an absolute delight to be here in Bryant Park with you, Olivia. Now, you're no stranger to New York. Indeed, you lived and worked here for years, didn't you, as a journalist, I believe? Yes, I. when I moved from Ireland first in the mid-90s, I spent three fantastic years here in the city. I was here from 94 to 97 and I had a column with the Irish Echo newspaper. Uh, it was, my column was called Tracings and it really was like a social column, girl about town. I went to all the theatrical openings, Irish Arts Centre, Irish Rep, uh, any of the Irish pubs. If there was something going on, I'd go along and I'd write who was who and who was there and all of that. And it was wonderful. It was great for my profile. It got me meeting a whole slew of people and just really really got me out there and got me a, a great sort of position here in, in New York at the time. It was wonderful. And then I continued it when I went out to LA. I kept the column, but it became more of a column about, you know, interesting stories, Irish, Irish American people with very interesting stories to tell. So I sort of switched it into that. And I had that column for like eight years. It was wonderful. Well, you're a successful actor now in Hollywood these days, Olivia, uh, with an entire list of professional film and TV credits to your name, which we'll get to in a moment. But tell me, you weren't always acting, were you? You were a teacher once. Tell me, what made you move from teaching, which is a very steady career, to modeling and then later acting? Well, you're going back a long way at this point. Let me see. I, yes, I was, I was a qualified teacher back in the early 80s when I came out of UCD in Dublin. The economy was like appalling at the time. Not that it's any better at the moment, but it was appalling at the time and there were really no jobs. And if I wanted to teach, I would have had to go into some little small country town somewhere and just sort of do a few hours here and a bit of substituting there. And I, I just was like, no, I, I can't see myself doing this. This was not adding up. And while I was a student, I used to work in a store in Dublin called Friends, F-R-E-N-D-S was the spelling on it. And it was a beautiful four-story store. It was really gorgeous, fabulous clothes, it was very stylish. And my dad was the accountant for that store. And he got me a job there while I was a student, you know, during holidays, Saturdays, weekends and stuff. And um, I just always loved the fashion side of things. I, it was always something I had a passion for. And one of the girls I worked with happened to go on to become an agent at a model agency, Geraldine Brand Agency. And because I knew her, because I was a little, I think, hesitant to sort of pick up the phone and call a modeling agency and go down to them for some reason. I saw this as some other world that maybe was somewhere where I didn't belong. Um, but I called her and uh, she said, oh yes, so if you come on in, we'd love to see you. So I got dressed up and I went in and met her and they took me on and literally, um, you know, a few days later I ended up getting a job for a runway show for Switzers, what was, it no longer exists in Dublin anymore. And it was a swimsuit show in January that took place in the window of Switzer's department store. 
and it, the whole thing was just hilarious and it ran for four days and we had like three or four shows a day and that was like my first I was just thrown into modeling and I hadn't had any training or anything at the time so I was really sort of acting on instinct at that point but it was fantastic and I worked with a great bunch of girls and it was a great start well as Miss Ireland in 1984 you went on Olivia to major stardom in Ireland attracting infinite media attention you enjoyed overnight celebrity and did Ireland proud with a sixth placing in the Miss Universe pageant where you were also voted best body in a bikini oh my god and your magnificent seven finalist placing in the Miss World contest by your reign's end you were co-hosting a prime time show on RTE television Murphy's micro quizm with the great Mike Murphy as well as live announcing on channels RTE 1 and RTE 2 there were also MC engagements across Ireland and countless modeling assignments from runway to print and product endorsements talk to me a bit about those heady days in Ireland, Olivia, what was it like being, if you'll excuse the expression, the Farrah Fawcett of <laughs> Ireland? <laughs> well, thank you. I take that as a compliment. Do you know, they were really great days. They were fantastic. You know, we used to go down the country and do all these shows in some of the different towns outside of Dublin and, and like, there'd be a bunch of girls on the bus and we had Ted, the bus driver, and we used to slag him about his white socks. He used to wear the white socks and the black shoes all the time. Uh, but he was the nicest guy and he was our steady bus driver everywhere we went. And we'd arrive down in these towns and we'd arrive into a hotel and we'd have our lunch and then it was like the afternoon would be spent trying on all the clothes and fittings and stuff and then it was like okay back to the hotel and there'd be a load of us like packed into a room and be all like you know vying for mirror space to try and get the makeup on and the whole thing and uh, then we'd go and do the show that night and then it was into the bus we'd be taking our makeup off on the bus and then of course we'd always stop for chips somewhere along the way on the way home and I know you're thinking models eating chips but when you've worked out on that runway for like whatever an hour and a half in a show you're hungry and you're ready to eat and it was a long drive home from some of the places we were at. I mean, I remember going to Castle Bar and places that were like a long distance from Dublin. But they were fantastic days. And actually, the lovely thing is I got to work with some of those girls again. Um, Sandra Curley in particular. Um, only quite recently when I was back in Dublin. God, it was this time last year, last September. It seems like recently uh, when I did a show for Marks and Spencers. And uh, they had her, herself and myself doing the runway show for them. And it was just so nice, like 25, 30 years later, nearly to get to work with somebody I'd worked with then. They were fun days. You then proceeded to establish your own image consulting business, Olivia, along with your work as editor for Ireland's popular Women's Way magazine. And it goes without saying, Olivia, that image is important to you, of course. So tell me, for all our female Radio Irish listeners out there, what are your top three secrets to beauty? Oh, well, first of all, sleep. If I don't get my sleep, I can do without food, but I can't do without sleep. But I'm not great without food either. I would say sleep, water, and happiness, laughter. It's a great medicine. Um, I think that, um, I, I suppose my philosophy about life really, Sean, is everything in moderation and balance. Um, you know, if you go out and have a great time and you're having a ball, well to hell, stay out and have your late night. But just don't do two or three of them in a row if you can avoid it. Moderation. Moderation. Uh, I'm not a big drinker, but I do love a glass or two of wine and I drink either white or red, depending on the mood or the setting. And um, what else? I, I, I'm a good eater. I eat very healthily. But I also love my ice cream. I love those little squares of chocolate. And I love cookies with a cup of tea. <laughs> so a sweet tooth. So I have a bit of a sweet tooth. But I, again, I sort of try to balance it all in moderation. So sleep, eat well. And um, I think, I actually I think one of the things that really gets in the way of beauty is when we let our lives get really stressful or when things sort of come down on top of us and stress takes over. I think that's an absolute killer for our health and consequently for our looks. Well, your theatrical career began in 1988, Olivia, with the title role of Cinderella in the Christmas pantomime at the Gaiety Theatre in Dublin. The next year you were back on the same stage as Maid Marian in Babes in the Wood, followed by a slew of leading roles in theatrical productions such as Mammy's Sexual Perversity in Chicago, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, and the particularly noted and notable Lady Chatterley's Lover, the D.H. Lawrence classic which attracted huge press coverage, all of it controversial at the time and centering around a photograph of you Olivia in what was then 
uh, considered a most provocative pose, wearing nothing but a sheer night slip, said to have been naughty but nice, lovely too. Now, when you look back at all the controversy regarding Lady Chatterley's lo lover, and I remember it myself, it seems like what do you play. think, what springs to mind most about all of that? Um, well, I do remember getting those photographs done, and I actually used a very good friend of mine, Vincent O'Byrne, he's a, a wonderful photographer in Dublin, who has actually won the Golden, Co Golden Kodak Awards or whatever, umpteen times, and he speaks at them and all of that in different parts of Europe. He did the pictures at the time, and, and actually it wasn't a sheer slip, it was a silk slip, but it was flimsy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, rem I actually loved the photographs, and in fact I have one of them, that poster, the main one that was used for the, for the show, I have it in framed on my wall going up the staircase to my office in the house. <laughs> so um, I'm, I was actually very proud of those pictures. But yes, it caused a lot of controversy. But you know something? We had cancellation lines outside the theatres, all the different cities we were in all over Ireland, Galway in particular. And uh, they were just lining up. They couldn't get enough of it. 1994, Olivia, brought you here to New York, where you launched your lifelong ambition to reside and act here in the United States, and you've been here ever since. Indeed, your first break came from the Irish Arts Centre here in New York uh, with the role of Dunya in Geraldine Aaron's black comedy, The Donahue Sisters. A break of another kind came from the Irish Echo, as you mentioned earlier on, where you wrote your own social column, which was yet another form of expanding your profile among the New York Irish. You also contributed to Ireland's best-selling Sunday independent newspaper, as well as penning a number of articles for the prestigious New York Times. Tell me, do you miss journalism? Uh, yeah, I suppose to a certain extent I do. Um, what is it about journalism that you miss the most? Um, I suppose I like interviewing people and I liked writing up the little articles and stuff afterwards but I found that it was actually taking up a lot of time and I was just you know when you cut things too fine and you, your, your energies are scattered and you just can't focus on what you're doing so I sort of slid out of it but I, I still write you know I do my own stuff I do my own creative writing and stuff and um, do you I didn't know that yeah I do um, I'm not as disciplined about it as I should be but I do um, I suppose I, I'm, I'm sort of into a novel that I've that I'm I'm toying with at the moment I'm still I don't quite know where my story is going so I'm in that very um, uncomfortable messy stage of creativity which we don't like but we just have to get in it and get through it and then somehow the story finds its way but um, yeah I do and and uh, I suppose my my theory for this year has been very much think of 2012 as the year where you pull out all the stops you just get out of the comfort zone and just go for things and do things differently and take chances and take risks so I'm documenting that as well along the way and Whether do we get a hint now of uh, the the, the storyline of the novel well, well that there are two different things the, the 2012 story is pretty much my own story of, of this year and, and how it's going along and the adventures along the way the uh, the novel is uh, pretty much set in Dublin retro 80s in fashion world oh really yes That's very they say write what you know so um, but I, I haven't been very disciplined on that of late and I really need to get back to it so thank you for reminding me and, and jogging me on on that but yes I suppose to a certain degree I do miss some of the journalism I'll tell you what I really miss uh, I went home to Ireland there in February and um, I had just gotten very bad news the editor of the Sunday Independent newspaper Angus Fanning he passed away and he was one of my greatest supporters. In fact, he's the person I can thank for getting me into the States legally because I ended up getting a writer's visa because I was able to write for them as a correspondent for New York. He got me the, the letter, I went into the embassy, and a week later I was on a plane and, and on, into New York. And that also helped as well get me into the Irish Echo and then the, uh, the New York Times. So it was, he, he was somebody that was a great friend to me and like for years we always stayed in touch and he'd call me out of the blue and you know sometimes Hollywood is not an easy place to be and it's a very diff difficult career and sometimes you'd be having your bad days and he'd call you up and he'd say, oh Livia, I think you're great, you've got great courage and he was just one of those people who was so supportive and not just towards me, towards a lot of people in the arts, he was very much um, a staunch supporter of the arts and he died suddenly, quite suddenly. He 
was ill for a while, but he, he unfortunately passed away, and he was only, I think, 67 or 69 or something. So that was a huge loss to me. It really saddened me. Uh, so unfortunately, Angus is not here, but I like to think that I have an angel there looking out for me. Yeah. Well, you moved out to Los Angeles in 1997, Olivia, where you continued your writing in Los Angeles whilst pursuing your acting career. Your television commercials and voiceovers have been many, as have your modeling assignments with the renowned Ford Model Agency. Your film credits include, among others, Angelica Houston's Agnes Brown, Jim Sheridan's In America, Tamara Simon Hoff's Red Roses and Petrol, Michael Bay's The Island, Curtis Hansen Warner Brothers movie Lucky You, where you feature as Isabel, the chic French lady on the arm of LC, played by screen legend Robert Duval. And this year you finished work on The Walk Around, directed by Jonathan Bray and Matt Miller. The role of which you are most proud, however, you've said, is Moya Doyle in Red Roses and Petrol, starring Malcolm McDowell. What is it about your role in Red Roses and Petrol, Olivia, that makes your work on this film so close to your heart? I think I loved the fact, first of all, when I met Tammy simon Hops, um, from the moment we spoke on the phone, we got along well. She just has this wonderful, open, friendly, energetic personality. And I think what I loved about that role was, first of all, it was a great, meaty character role. And I loved the fact that she was willing to take a chance on me doing that role, because usually I was always put more in the stylish, glamorous woman section as if you can't do anything else and that's fine I, I don't mind being typecast it's all right we just all want to work I'm not one of these actors who's like oh no I want to play a bag lady no I don't want to play a bag lady <laughs> but um, having said that if I had to I could but um, I don't think I'd be their first choice but the the role of Moya Doyle was such a wonderful all-round meaty role and for someone to give you the opportunity to play that role it was just fantastic and to go to work every day and be on the set all the time not sitting you know in the trailer sort of waiting to be called all day long not that I mind that either it's just great to work whether you're sitting in the trailer but it's particularly nice when you go to work to just be busy all day long because one it keeps your energy going and it's just nice to do what you love to do um, and it was great to work with Malcolm McDowell I mean he plays these sinister characters in so many roles in so many movies he's he's the, one of the nicest people I've ever met and he made me feel so welcome um, so it, re it was a great experience I mean it was a whirlwind we shot the movie in like less than three weeks or something and it was just go 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 six days a week boom 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 um, but it was wonderful and Tammy was just a great person to work with she's the kind of lady like you'd go to work and if you had an idea about the character or about you know the script or whatever she was just so open to it. you didn't feel like you had to toe the line or you have to watch your P's and Q's you were just very relaxed working with her and that meant a lot to me but it meant a lot to me to get a role of that of that quality and and that sort of character role that sort of was a little off the cuff for me it was great that she took that chance on me yeah well you're absolutely brilliant as Moya Doyle in Red Roses and Petrol Olivia now your television credits include Windfall by NBC The Handler on CBS Gilmore Girls Warner Brothers Guiding Light for CBS and the ambassador for the BBC to mention just a few. Talk to me a little about working on television as opposed to film, Olivia. Is there a big difference from an actor's point yeah, of view? There is, definitely. Um, I, I, I love to work, period, but I definitely prefer working on film than on, than on TV. And the main difference, I think, is that when you work on film, it's like you're just this big family and it's all being done in two or three months usually but in you know the case of red roses it was like three weeks but you know you've got a, a, a pocket of time where you're all together working on this movie and you don't feel that terrible sense of pressure and stress and the minutes are ticking away and everyone is on edge whereas in television there's there the pressures are much more they're trying to get a certain amount shot within the day and um, time pressures much more uh, yeah, definitely much more time pressure in, in TV uh, and you feel that and also sometimes you're only in for a couple of days so you don't get to know people and people are too busy and they can't be coming over and introducing themselves and you know making nice it's just everyone has to get on with their work so it's a little bit more impersonal um, 
you know, but sometimes you have great experiences as well on TV. Like I worked last year with uh, Fran Drescher on Happily Divorced, her comedy series. Yes. And um, that was a fabulous crew to work with. I mean, I was only literally a day on the set, but it was a great experience. She was wonderful. And um, th the whole thing, and it was a comedy, and it was just a very, very fun day. And there was no sense of pressure or anxiety or anything like that. But sometimes there can be with television. But you just think of it as par for the course. It's just in a day's work, you know? Tell me, with more and more movies turning to special effects these days and relatively unknown actors getting to fill the roles that were once filled by big-name stars, do you think the film industry, especially the Hollywood film industry, is, is becoming an easier place to find work or is it becoming more difficult to score roles in oh, Hollywood? Oh, I think it's definitely more difficult without question. Um, because what's happening now is once upon a time, you know, major movie stars would not do t television because it was considered to be like, you know, the lesser medium. Um, now you've got major stars doing TV series. You also have major stars doing guest starring roles. Um, which is where I very often fit in. So I am edged out of that into the lower co-starring roles. So it's much more difficult because you have the really established mega stars up there working these, these parts because they're now getting offered these parts and they're taking them. Like also with commercials as well, there's a lot of that going on too with, um, you know, the stars are doing uh, endorsements. Yes. Um, also, I've noticed a lot I see with commercials, you know, they're not just looking for actors to play doctors or dentists or, or you know, real estate agents or whatever. They're looking for real doctors, real dentists, real realtors, um, you know, to play these roles. So again, it's edging the actor out. The whole reality thing has really, like, gone taken over in many ways. You know? and, and how about the internet now? Do you see an opening there for actors? Well, definitely without question, yeah. There's a lot of web series and things going on now. Um, and definitely that is an extension. And I think that's going to just expand more and more. I mean, we're probably only at the, we're only at the beginning of it. It's only the tip of the iceberg, I'd say. So that is great, yes. We're, we're very grateful for that. But yeah, there's a lot of the stars taking the, the smaller roles, the guest starring roles and, and recurring roles maybe that might be for two or three or four weeks and something. Um, so it's hard. But you know, you can't necessarily let that stop you either because sometimes they don't take them and sometimes you're the one that gets the job. <laughs> Now, you've also received a triumphant reception returning to the Dublin catwalk for the M&S Autumn Winter Fashion Show at the warehouse in Barrow Street last year. How does it feel, Olivia, to be back doing some modelling? Oh, that was fantastic. You know, modelling is something that has really always been part of my life. I kind of got out of it for a while when I was in my 30s um, because I was really focusing ma mainly on, on theatre and writing. Um, and then when I moved out to California um, in the sort of mid to late 90s, I joined a commercial agent out there and they happened to have a print division so I went into them and they were like yeah you have a great look and you know I think we could get you some work and whatever and then I just started doing more print work and then it just sort of developed from there and, and then when my hair went this color what are we going to call it silver platinum, platinum whatever we blonde. want to call it Claude. I don't know if it's platinum blonde but it's, we, we say silver <laughs> platinum that's as close to the truth and um, I, it definitely put me into an older category but it got me a lot more work because it, it put me into sort of the baby boomer division. So it was a really good career move for me, um, both in terms of commercials and acting roles and um, print work and the modeling and all of that. And, and the print work then went not just for the commercial side of things, but also um, for fashion. So actually one of the reasons I'm back in New York this summer is um, I've joined with an agency here, a Ford agency in New York have set me up with images here in New York, a Ford agency in LA fit me up with um, images here in New York. So I'm, I'm with them and then I also just joined with Innovative for commercials here in New York as well. So um, hopefully it's an exciting summer ahead with, filled with lots of work and opportunity we all hope. That's fantastic, congratulations. Well this year also you were invited to present at the Irish Film and 
Independent Television Awards 2012 in Dublin, the Best Actor in Film Award to Michael Fassbender for his role in the movie Shame. How was that, Olivia, to present the award to Michael Fassbender? That whole event was just phenomenal. It was just magic from beginning to end. And Michael actually seems like a really nice guy, very, very humble, ordinary guy, very handsome, might I add. And uh, just coincidentally, it turned out that the two of us ended up on the red carpet together, just like we came in at the same time and it was never <laughs> set up that way, it just happened. Um, so that was kind of fun. So I have a few nice pictures of the pair of us on that. But um, the whole event was fantastic. He's obviously a hugely talented actor and I think he's like really just going to take off. He already has really in many ways. But um, it, it, the whole thing was great. I'd never been at an award ceremony like that in Ireland before. And I felt so proud, I have to say, when I went into the convention center in Dublin and I saw the setup. I mean, it was like I had just walked into like, you know, the theater in, in LA where they do the, the Egyptian theater where they put up the, the Golden Globes and the Oscars. It was of the same caliber. It was fantastic. I know that the CEO of the um, IFTAs in Ireland, uh, Anya Moriarty, she's, um, see, I'm part Kerry, part Dublin, and she's full Kerry. And the two of us get on like a house on fire. But she does a great job, and I just love the fact that despite all the, you know, the downer on the economy and all of that, that she still manages to pull together these awards and they go on every year. It's just wonderful to have that sense of celebration and festivity and that things are still thriving despite what's been going on with the economy. So that was fabulous. Um, and I had, oh, it was a magical night. I actually sat at her table and who was sitting beside us but Jim Sheridan and his wife and um, no other than our president, uh, Michael D. Higgins and his wife, Sabina. So it was a really, um, it was a very special night and I was quite delighted as well because I didn't know what I was going to wear going back to the fashion. And it was, I went all over LA and I was like, how come I can't find a decent dress for this event? I mean, I thought I'd be spoiled for choice. It was just one of those times when I was sort of between seasons and I, I couldn't find anything. So I was going to go for the old reliable out of my own closet, but then I got back to Dublin and I ended up in Louise Kennedy's showroom and <laughs> I ended up in a magnificent black bead number with the ostrich feathered boa <laughs> oh. and I was like oh a very happy camper and diamonds by my friend Maria Collins she's a, a jeweler and she came down to the Shelburne to don me out in the diamonds so the whole thing was very glamorous and fun and exciting and it was just really fun yeah well you also do stellar work for the Irish Fair Foundation in Orange County California I believe indeed the St. Patrick's Day Southern California Rose of Tralee Ball is an Irish American cultural event which takes place annually on or around St. Patrick's Day. It's a gala event set around a pageant where one contestant is chosen as the Southern California Rose. This past year has been your seventh time to host this event, Olivia. Uh, the chosen Southern California Rose then gets to go to the beautiful Kingdom of Kerry in mm -hmm. County Kerry in Ireland to compete in the long-standing Rose of Tralee pageant, which is televised for two nights running on RTE. Now, what does your involvement in this event mean to you, Olivia? Well, I suppose my dad was from Kerry, and when I was a teenager and a child, right through my, my, my young years, uh, we always went to Kerry on, vac on vacation, on holidays. Uh, we started out going to my grandfather's house in Killarney, and then we went over to Glen Bay, which is over by the beach area, and every summer that's where we went. So every summer we would always go in August, and the Rose of Tralee pageant was always taking place at the same time. And I can literally remember, I was like a little thing of, I'd say, seven or eight, and we would go in and I'd love it because it was all exciting and there was all the girls were all over the place and they were always dressed up all the contestants for the pageant and I was just in awe of this whole thing and year after year it was like you know the, the thrill of the holiday to go into the Rose of Tralee for me so I associated with my father uh, who unfortunately is no longer with us but he's been gone over 10 years but uh, I, it, it just gives me has great memories and it has a, a special place for me um, um, also, uh, when you move to a big sprawling place like Los Angeles, it's so lovely to be just taken in with tender loving care into the Irish community and that's how I was received when I went there and the Irish Fair Committee were fantastic 
um, for that I went actually do you know how it started I went to um, you see when you go to mass good things happen I went to the um, a church there was a St. Patrick's Day mass on in a church over at Hancock Park and I heard about it it was on some Sunday afternoon or whatever I can't remember what day it was but I went to this event ended up meeting a load of people and a lot of the people from the Irish Fair were there and they were like you know the, the, the ball is taking place next week why don't you come and I went to the event and it was just fantastic I really enjoyed it and I stayed friends with all of these people and then they started asking me you know to judge and to host and then I just sort of have become this person who seems to host it not every year but a lot of years I'm sure they'll change it up now and again because it could get boring to have the same old same old but um, it's really nice to be involved with it every year you're also the ambassador of the LA Irish Film Festival I believe tell me about yeah, that yeah um, that's very exciting yeah the person who started that is a girl called Lisa McLaughlin she's uh, from Donegal and she started up the LA Irish Film Fest it's now going into its fifth year it's going to take place in Los Angeles at the uh, last weekend in September early October and um, you know it started out she did she was sort of just let's put this together for one year and see what happens and it was a huge success because generally the one thing I will say about us Irish we're very supportive of one another so if we're putting on something whether it's a play a film festival whatever a book signing whatever it may be we all tend to come out rally round have a few drinks lend the support and we all have a good time and get the ball rolling and that's what happened with the first festival and it went from strength to strength and now it's going into its fifth year I'm going to be more involved with it this year I used to always partake in it I'd go along to it in the opening nights and I'd go to some of the movies and everything but uh, this year actually they chose Lisa to be the Irish woman of the year the Irish fair chose her as the Irish woman of the year and I was delighted because I suggested her because I see the amount of work she does on this on this festival and it's like literally when she's finished one festival she's already planning for the next one a year later so I just thought here's somebody who's really doing something for the Irish film industry so let's just put it out there and I was thrilled they chose her as, as the Irish woman of the year which I think was a great choice so um, I will be in there helping out doing what I can and I'll be at the, all the events and the opening night and all of that so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it very exciting indeed so tell me what's next for Olivia Tracy what is next for me well that is a good question I feel like I'm in this transition time this thing of coming to New York for the summer is something I've wanted to do for a long time because it's a city I, I love dearly I had three magnificent years here in the 90s people say that all the time I know people who move out to Los Angeles having lived in New York and they miss, and they miss New York yeah what is it about the city that, the, that, that, that you miss most it's it's like what is it that the energy and, and people are down to earth and they say what they mean and they've got a sense of humor and they're funny and you know they're actually New Yorkers are very helpful people you know I think before I moved to New York I kind of thought I was going to this really tough city they have hearts of gold and if you're in trouble they'll be the first person to help you out and that was my experience and if they can't they'll tell you no I can't but that guy over there can here Johnny uh, this girl needs help you know they're very like that and they're, they're just very straightforward and what you see is what you get there's a great sincerity about New Yorkers there's also a great excitement and magic about the city and there's just so many like this particular part here in, in Bryant Park it's one of my favorite parts of the city um, I just think it's so pretty I love coming in here for lunch we had our little picnic and stuff here today and that's always a treat um, but yes and I have a lot of friends still here in this town and it's a city that was very good to me you know when I moved to the States first it's a huge move and it's a scary move and you don't know what lies ahead and it was very good and it, it sort of opened its arms to me and, and um, I had very very happy times here I think it's probably the, the time in my life if you ask me what was the happiest time in your life besides my Miss Ireland year I would say that's that that those three years in New York so we're gonna see more of you in New York well I hope so I'm, I'm here for the summer I, I decided to come on a whim because when I got this agency I thought okay let's go and get in a commercial agent as well and let's spend a few months here I've talked about doing it and let's stop this talk about things and go and do them throw the procrastination out the window and get on with it so I'm here and I would love to be toing and froing I do have something theatrical as well that I have to audition for while I'm here and I can't talk about it yet because it may not happen and I'm superstitious but if it does happen that would be quite wonderful that would be the icing on the cake so we'll see and if it does well then I'll be back later in the year well, we're very curious now all together yeah, about curious, that one <laughs> first to know Sean if it comes through I hope it will you're out to God's ears and we hope so too 
Well, as always, Olivia, it is a great pleasure chatting with you about all your activities, and you'll come back to us here on Radio Irish to chat with us soon again, won't you? Oh, of course. I'm always happy to be on Radio Irish and to see you, Sean. My God, it's a long time. Thanks very much, Olivia. Thank you. Broadcasting 24-7 to the Irish community, RadioIrish.com.